Hej och välkommen till Penselbank och vår temadag för 5G. Jag heter Marcus Sandrud och jag är analytiker här i banken. Idag så har jag med mig eh, Anders Storm som är vd på Sivers Semiconductors. Varmt välkommen. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, my name is Anders Storm. I'm the group CEO of Sivers and I'm going to tell you a little bit about focus on 5G and of course start with uh, an intro to the company. So, Siever Semiconductors, uh, we are a company who are within semiconductors, of course, and we recently also acquired a company, so the company is a bit larger now. We, it's a company called Mixcom from the US. So, the company today is uh, almost 140 people. Uh, we have a very strong uh, educational level with 42 PhDs. We have a strong investor base, as I'm going to go into, and we have a cash position of 46 million uh, US dollars right now. We're working in two business areas. One is the wireless business area where we focus on these 5G things I'm going to tell you about today. And another one is the photonics area where we focus on uh, fiber, uh, fiber to the home, data centers, and different types of sensors that we can make for those kind of lasers. And we have a fab for that in Glasgow. And we also have a head office in, in Stockholm. Currently, the company has, together with Mixcom, 44 design wins within 5G. And we're working also in other areas like SATCOM and Radar, uh, including that. So if we look a little bit about uh, the past events of uh, where, where Sievers Semiconductors is coming from, uh, previously the company was called Sievers IMA. And we actually changed the name in, in uh, 2020 to Sievers Semiconductors to reflect more what company we are. And we started a new strategy uh, approximately six years ago where we looked into how we can sort of address these high frequency markets where we're coming from, but make, move that into 5G when now 5G becomes sort of um, really dependent on that technology in the base stations, in the phones and all of that. So we started a new strategy. We were at that time at Axitoriot or Spotlight in 2017. Uh, we also acquired the photonics company in Glasgow which that name was CST Global at that time, which is now Sievers Photonics. We listed on Nasdaq first growth market, and we started to get our first design wins within 5G from the designs we were actually doing. And we also started adding a very, very interesting partner network. And that's been one of the cornerstones of building up the company to add sort of large blue ship companies that complement our technology and can then be built into systems. We kept on uh, investing and building the company. I mean, it's, it's a semiconductor company needs sort of a long runway to get to final products and so forth. So in 2018, we brought in our first institutional investors. We also had a very important win uh, in, in being selected the best industry showcase on one of the most prestigious conferences for these kind of chips uh, from IEEE. We progressed and added more customers, and we also added our first Fortune 100 customers in the photonics business into the company in uh, 2019 uh, with, uh, with Sivish Photonics. We accelerated the customer acceleration, and, and we grow like, the number of design wins to 21 in 2020. We got one large order in, we renamed the company, and then uh, we came into this last phase now in 2021 where we've been accelerating the work with the Fortune 100s. We're up to 26 design wins, plus the acquisition of Mixcom, we're 44. And we also listed on Nasdaq main list in June. So a lot of things have gone in to build the company. And we had something of like 20,000 shareholders uh, in Sweden uh, in 2021. And we also, 20% uh, of the ownership are now uh, large institutions. And as you can see here, this is sort of the, the current uh, shareholder list uh, without acquisition, which we accept to close within sort of a, a week. So some of the larger ones in Swedbank, Rubur, New Technology, AMF, uh, Small Cap Fund, Third AP Fund, and so forth, which is part of the shareholders together with some larger uh, shareholders was, that was in the company from the beginning. So what are we doing then? Yeah, we are focusing on 5G technology. We're taking sort of uh, silicon uh, to, to into chips, and we're making the chips. And then the chips and the antennas becomes a module, which is then used in different kinds of applications. 
everything to what we call fixed wireless access, where you can get broadband into the home. You can have base stations and, and, and mobile phones for, of course, connecting. You can have mesh mobile networks where you build out like we've done in, in, in London, for example, around Trafalgar Square. You can connect trains with track to train applications, which I'm going to tell you about, which, which, where we use the 5G. You have vehicles and transportation in general, and that's where we have all the 44 design wins for 5G today. So what is really 5G? Yeah, it's the fifth generation mobile network and the promise of one gigabit speeds in the networks and also very low latency, the time it takes from sending one thing to, to the other side, which is very important for many new applications and, and also specifically maybe cars and, and autonomous driving and all of those things. 5G comes in th sort of three different forms. One is sort of the low band 5G, which is on, on a very low frequency. We have the mid band, which is up to six gigahertz, and we have the high bands where Sievers is working on the 24 gigahertz and upwards. Um, if we look at what, what these kind of technologies actually give you, uh, so the low band is actually more or less sort of a, a glorified 4G in its sense. It's using sort of the 5G, uh, 5G NR, but it approximately gives you 50, megahertz, uh, 50 megabit per second. It goes very far because the frequency is very low. The mid-band goes shorter, but you can get sort of up to 100, 200 megabit per second when, when uh, everything is used. And you can see here, I, I did a trial here on, on 5G with, with the Telia here in Stockholm, got about 108 megabit per second download speed. And then you have the sort of really high speed 5G, which is in the millimeter wave bands where Sievers and Mixcom is doing all the work which is the sort of, in our world, the true 5G that gives you sort of two gigabits per second and upwards. We have, we have sort of the unlicensed 5G where we're doing up to five gigabit per second to track the train applications today. So why, why is this performance so different between all of these things? So the, the sort of low band and mid band spectrum is really cramped into very, very small channels, the, the current spectrum, so to speak, but also you have then the, the wider channels of the millimeter wave spectrum for 5G where you really, it's the amount of bandwidth you can use that gets you the actual speed in the network. So the speed is not dominated by the, w the length of the waves or anything, it's not the millimeter wave in itself, it's more the width of the, of the channel. And, and the channels uh, at millimeter wave are sort of 20 times larger than any channels has been ever in the sort of the whole Wi-Fi and 5G world which really increases the throughput. What is the status then? Yeah, so a lot of the 5G you hear about, specifically in Europe, all is sort of this majority of sub-6 gigahertz 5G or mid-band 5G as we have here in Sweden, and you get 100 megabits per second. In the US, they have started with what they call the sort of broadband 5G, or, uh, and that is sort of 28 gigahertz, and they get, you know, one to two gigabit per second. You can see now during Super Bowl, they tested two gigabits per second in the stadium, for example. So the rollouts are quite different in the world right now, and, and the millimeter wave frequencies are now coming more and more where we are working uh, in that sense. And, and the US is first, uh, Asia is going to, like China is going to happen in 2023. And then we have the other things uh, in, in Europe coming after that as well. However, the unlicensed 5G frequencies are already used in Europe, and we have uh, at least six, seven different deployments already here from everything from track to train, fixed wireless access, or to, to mesh networks as well, but it's a very early stage with some customers. So if you look at the, the product offering we have, we have everything then from the beam formers in 5G, which is actually the ones who decide how you send the signal in the, in the, in the air. And then we also have SATCOM, which is sort of uh, not in 5G, of course, but to complement to 5G for more rural applications. We have what's called repeaters with the acquisition from Mixcom. This is actually taking the base station and you take the signal and, and increase the signal and move it around corners and you do certain things with it. And these repeaters are so much cheaper than the sort of base stations that you build out. And they are going to be a very important piece of the network that's going to be built out. We also have al algorithms to support these kind of things on a software level now with the acquisition of Mixcom. If we look at the Sievers product range, we have had these kind of things as well, but sort of a different mix and a bit higher integration level on what we call the RFICs, where we have more in CPEs and, and home units. 
We also have the antennas, which we developed and, and are out now in, in 10 different applications with customers. And then we use evaluation kits to sort of win the market in, in this sense. So that's, that's sort of the, the major piece of the 5G technology we have, and it's, it's sort of a very important piece. And this technology connects into what's called the baseband, and that's where we're working with a lot of partners to integrate that to become the de facto standard of 5G equipment uh, for those who have those basebands. So what are the use cases, uh, as I mentioned? So what we call this sort of an infrastructure part where, where CVS has been sort of the, the standard uh, products into, and it's sort of the base station, the standard ones. You have the fixed wireless access, these both base stations and home units. You have these mesh networks where you put up a lot of small cells and they can go different routes as we've done around Trafalgar Square. We have the backhaul and cell fall, which is sort of part of the 5G network, but that's actually something we recently also had an agreement with the company around how you do that when they call Max Linear and you can get sort of 10 gigabits backhaul from the base station and back to the network and out to the internet. Another thing is, of course, the, the things you do in transportation, how you connect buses and cars, as we've done in Japan, the trains in the UK, and then you have Industry 4.0, where we are scratching the surface, where you really need the low latency and the high bandwidth in some applications, which we're also working on, and have some design wins in that has not come to the market yet. So the complete offering that we have now, and, and which is really important, that it's all the way from the devices. We recently had a press release with Cremo, who has an antenna in package display and a sort of USB type of dongles. We, we're getting into consumer electronics that way. We, currently, we are in sort of more in the, in, in the dongle stuff. Uh, base stations, of course, as I mentioned. You have the home units and the CPEs and the hotspot and the repeaters. So all of that's going to be part of the licensed 5G. In the iLicense band, we're doing some of that as well, but we're also using backhaul, transportations. You can do radars. You can do fixed wireless access in certain things. So all of these things, is 5G is a very broad term, and you can actually use it in many different ways. And then you also use the different frequencies in different ways. But all of these I've mentioned here will be used for uh, using millimeter wave and there our technology is. And how do we get in and win these different deals and work in the ecosystem? One, one thing is to have a broad network of partners. And we have built up a very, very strong network now uh, within, for example, the baseband modems. We have other systems here as well, and you can see also that some of the photonics guys. But for example, IDT Renaissance, which has, has the baseband, the rapid wave baseband in the unlicensed spectrum. We've been working with them now for five years, and most of our design wins in the in Sievers comes from a partnership with them. We've also been working with NXP now to integrate that with the latest technology as we talked about. Max Linear, just a week ago, we had a press release with them for the point-to-point -point links. Uh, Mixcom brings in both Silinx, which they're using in the repeaters, and SciTune, another baseband company, and so forth. So all of those things are we trying to tie together into a really, really interesting uh, offer where we can sort of have pre-integrated products with these large partners. And this is a little bit about the, the press release on, we had on backhaul for 5G networks. And what is really key here is you get the 10 gigabits per second, because if you're going to have you know, one gigabit or, or a, a C-band station with 100 megabits and 200 users, you need to put that data back into the system somehow from the base station. So these kind of backhaul networks with the 10 gigabit per second unlicensed spectrum with this uh, solution we have going to be quite important. And we already have a customer now working on these things to, to bring these into the mesh networks and give the backhaul. We also have uh, 10 design wins uh, now that is sort of have ready products. We got an order actually in 3rd of January for $2.1 million for sort of the first kind of volume order, I would say, from one of the customer eight devices who is in turn has a customer then in the US. We have Adtran, Fujikura, and, and, and um, uh, Cambio Network, which are sort of tier two type of customers. We also have a tier one customer type now that we have a design win, but they're not hardware yet uh, via the Mixcom acquisition. So all of these different technologies you can see here, Blue Wireless, for example, they are using their technology to connect trains and, and military equipment. But give you some flavor uh, digging down to these, acquisition, uh, these uh, companies. 
Uh, this is what uh, you can see up now around Trafalgar Square. This is sort of a mesh network node which you can use for both sending uh, data back and forth from, from Wi-Fi and mesh spots. But you can also, as you see in the white picture there, uh, you can have a, a unit on the wall somewhere as they have in Soho and do, they do a fixed wireless access on gigabit speeds. And this box here can handle 360 degrees and also handle you know, 4.6 4 gigabits per second per, per those sectors. So there's four sectors. So there's a lot of capacity in one of those boxes. If we look at uh, Fujikura in Japan, which we also now signed the supply agreement uh, last year, uh, we have, uh, they have sort of solutions that they've been testing with transportation. So automot uh, uh, automotive buses or uh, autonomous buses, I would say have actually used this in Japan to, to use the really low latency to drive these buses around. They also have a product for a CPE solution. And this is what we're hoping to see now getting into the market. Another company is EVO Rail, who has actually uh, implemented this solution. Unfortunately, we have the pandemic out and nobody is going by trains. They've, they've it's down to 10% of, of uh, their capacity recently. But so they have moved forward with the, with the implementation decisions, but there's going to be one maybe late March about what they're going to do next in the UK. They have always talked about building out the first between London and Glasgow, for example. And here you actually get a, a, a base station every 500 meters or one kilometer between, and you have a, 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 a thing on the roof, an antenna on the roof, where you then have Wi-Fi inside the train. And you can actually get then um, two gigabits per second in the back of the train and in front of the train from two different base stations. So you can have a shared peak of like four gigabits per second. And here we actually have a latency, latency that is 10 times lower than the, ten, than the target for 5G. So this is really exciting and the only system in the world actually that can handle this. So we are really happy to be part of this project uh, in that sense. Another completely different solution is actually this from Airwine, they call Wave Tunnel, where they're actually using this to replace cables in the wall. Most cables today have the 100 megabit per second type of things, uh, and, and everybody wants gigabit per second in the cabling from also in the house, of course, or, or in, in the office. So what, what Airwine is talking about is that there are 5 million uh, buildings in the US that needs to change cables. So then they can use our technology to blast this thing through walls and get the gigabit speeds. So here is uh, the example on the, on the recent uh, application or the recent order we got for $2.1 million here the 3rd of January. Here you can see on the right hand side the antenna and the module with the baseband from, from um, IDT that, that eight devices had developed and now are selling into a wireless internet service provider in the US. This is a really exciting product that we're part of. Here is another one, the, the tier one major telco that we get via Mixcom, uh, and they are building a base station. And they're then going to use, uh, you're going to see this really small. You can use one of these, of course. It's a 39 gigahertz array with four chipsets on, but you can also use these things in these larger uh, arrays, and you can build them together. So you use 12 of those, and then you get sort of a, a loss. In. So the first prototype order was received recently on that. To give you some understanding why we sort of purchased Mixcom is to show this comparison between us and a competitor in the US. So the array on the left hand side actually gets sort of the state of the art base station output power of a 60 dBm uh, from the phased array module. And we're only using 12 of these small and that gives us an array of about 100 paths. Our competitor who's developed a similar thing, they have a they have get the same power with 300 paths. So they're going to have three times more uh, RF uh, ways and, and also chipsets to actually achieve what we can achieve with Mixcom's technology, which is sort of fantastic. So that's why we're so keen on this technology. Also, another thing that Mixcom had developed and are working on with, with one of the largest MSOs in the US, that's a 50 billion revenue NASDAQ company, and they already invested heavily in, in the first trial that was done together with Silinx uh, in the US in Q4, and we're now entering the second phase of that project. So that is uh, actually with these uh, 39 gigahertz uh, antenna in packages inside, four of them on each direction, and then we can actually have these kind of repeaters that they can put out so they can reduce cost and, and reach uh, everywhere with this. 
So if you look at, at uh, why is it millimeter wave is so important on top of you know, uh, that, that it actually has all of these high speeds. So one very important thing is there is that, that the array and the size of the chip and the antenna is exponentially sort of smaller with the higher frequencies. So if you look at this antenna here, for example, you see very, very small patches, and there are 16 of them on here. And you can see the picture on there, how small it is, 15 times 50 millimeter. On the left-hand side, you can see an array for a 2 gigahertz system, which is so much larger and, of course, so much more expensive, as well as the bandwidth is much smaller there. So it makes so much sense in the long run to move over to high-frequency products. So this is sort of the fundamental background to why technology is going to be used as well and need to be used, both the bandwidth that is up there and also the size and the cost, which is reducing. And you can also then reduce power, power and all those things as well. So what are we doing here in the future to, to sort of really address this market? When I was here on the last 5G uh, theme day, uh, we actually launched from the silver side this new product that is on the way out, which is really interesting, and we will talk more about that now in the Mobile World Congress. And also, Mixcom recently launched this uh, antenna in package solution that's been developed together with uh, Global Foundry, which is now also a shareholder of Sievers. So these are very important uh, aspects of, of the next generation. So here we have RFICs, we have beamformers, and we have antenna in package solutions that will be our 5G future in the license bands. So to sort of finish off in a bit here, uh, of course, there's coming something after 5G as well, and, and uh, it's going to call, be called 6G. However, it's going to be quite far, further in the future, sometime around 2030. Spectrum, however, just because of the two things I talked about, the bandwidth is going to go up and the, they want it smaller and cheaper. So the spectrum is going to be even higher up, 95 gigahertz and upwards, 140 gigahertz are some sort of projects working on right now out there for prototyping. And they're going to go down to the one microsecond latency. They want it to be 1,000 times faster, uh, probably not 1,000, it's probably going to be 10 times faster. But, and, and they want sort of uh, the millisecond uh, latency here as well. So, and what is really interesting with this is, of course, that this is right on the sweet spot for civil semiconductors to keep on building on the technology. So we are not just a company who works with the fifth generation. We're going to be very interesting for the sixth generation and so forth, because the frequencies will only go up. And that's happening not just in 5G. It's happening in sat satellite communications, radars, and everywhere. So we're really uh, happy to be sort of with the right place at the right time and have the right personnel and people who can actually deliver on these technologies. So, to summarize everything, uh, 5G comes in many, many different forms and, and shapes, of course. Uh, everything from the low band to the mid band to the millimeter wave. And, and it's really important to understand that it is only sort of the millimeter wave that will give you the true 5G experience here. And that's sort of going to be really important as, as things are building out. We have 10 design wins right now that is ready and have the ready hardware. Approximately 16, we've said, going to be sort of in, within 9 to 12 months. So that is really important to understand sort of the trajectory we are working on now, even if the pandemic has been sort of delaying a bit. But from second half this year, we're seeing that all of this is going to start rolling much, much better. Uh, and there are many different use cases. It's not just about connecting your mobile phone, even if we're going to be closer to that now, but all of those different use cases where you have um, broadband to the home, connected cars, uh, trains, uh, Industry 4.0, and all of those things. We, we are going to address that, and, and repeaters, and all of those things. So I think we're in a very good position to be part of this market, and we're already showing that we are really the the biggest challenger below sort of the large vendors like Qualcomm and ADI and so forth. 6G in 2023, it will be very, very important for millimeter wave as well. And uh, I'm really happy that we got the first order now, and it's important to, to talk about that as well, and not just the delays in, in the market in general for components, but also that we can see now that it is opening up and, and, and the fourth wave is going away, and, and we are quite confident that after that we'll see a shift in this in the market here. So that is basically what I had. Thank you so much. Right. Thank you very much, Anders, and, and thank you for a very interesting presentation.
Let me start maybe a bit broad, to talk about 5G in general. Um, I'm just curious about the drivers of, of 5G, because we come from a we come from a 4G network, and it was maybe it was longer ago than you sense, but <laughs> it was a while ago since yes. it came. But <clears throat> if I remember right, if we look at like previous drivers of of memory and the whole like development has been driven by sort of like consumer factors like Netflix and, and has mm. has kind of dominated the space. And I think as we move over to 5G, it's going to be different drivers. Let's talk a little bit about those drivers and what's going to drive the need to like kind of go up. Mm. Because there's going to be more factors, I guess, like autonomous driving, like yes. Industry 4.0 and stuff like yes. that. Of course. I mean, I, I think if you look at the Ericsson uh, sort of mobility report, it's still sort of video and, and you know, uh, real-time video, uh, mm -hmm. uh, Ultra HD, and all of those things that are driving it right now. Mm -hmm. uh, but then sort of, as you point out, in the next step, 5G will, and, and of course, we're getting more into not just the sort of the bandwidth, but also the latency and all sort of real-time applications with autonomous cars, uh, VR, AR applications, all of those things, or the metaverse, which is the, the latest word for, for all of this, is sort of exactly what you need to have these technologies. So all of those things are driving it, and, and, and um, I would say the first step is the, the, the need in the home. It's always started there, and, and you know you have all the people who are gaming and all of those things, and low latency needs. And uh, like um, Analysis Mason are saying that from mid 2020s, 25 somewhere, the, the sort of comfort speed in the home is going to be one gigabit per second for everyone. Yeah. So, so that is sort of what's driving the fixed wireless access and that's why that's first in these things. And then you have the rest of the stuff I talked about. And do you think this is gonna be more important? Like if, if, I, if, I, look at, if I look at, for instance, a in production line or if I look at autonomous driving, um, and, and further automation of the, of the industrial landscape, for instance. I mean, we're talking immense amount of traffic that that's going to need. Yes. I, is, is that a larger driver, or is it still going to be like the consumer needs of you and I who want to have wearables and mobile phones, or is it going to be a big combination of those? It's going to even out, that's my guess. I mean, f from now it's the consumers who drive it. I mean, they yeah. just recently on, on social media it was all about photos. Now everything is about video, TikTok, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's driving traffic. And, and as, as in the, I mentioned in the Ericsson uh, report, they are talking about exponential growth. And it's been that now for years. It's sort of like Moore's law. It's just there. It's yeah. just growing. Yeah. But, but of course, all of those other things, you know, uh, as, as we're getting into to track to train applications now, and trains have a lot of data, they want to sort of burst that off into when they stop at the train station or whatever. That, they're collecting data everywhere. Mm -hmm. so, so all of that needs to be, be used. And, and then, of course, AR, VR, and, and autonomous cars. And, 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 of course, that's a, p a part forward that you need mm -hmm. to have that. But, you know, a, a car with, with the connectivity and the safety that you want to have when you get there is going to be very, very important. And that's going to push a lot of data into the systems. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and tied to that, I guess, uh, which always puzzled me a bit, but it, it, it's kind of the cost for investment. We know that back in the like 2000s, and we have the, I, I, if it was 3G then, but you, you mm -hmm. had these mm -hmm. auctions which yeah, yeah. drove down like the values of Vodafone, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Who's paying for this? And, and who is the kind of like benefit? Because, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, I want to upload videos, but at the end of the day, who is, I think in the last, it's been Apple who's been, mm -hmm. who's been kind of the winner, but they didn't invest in it all. Mm -hmm. I mean, they invested in apps, et cetera, but not in the infrastructure. Who's, mm -hmm. who's, who's the driver on the investments and who's... Yeah, uh, good question. So, so there are uh, three pieces, I would say, in, in this value chain. You, you, first of all, you have the semiconductor companies who mm -hmm. delivers to Apple and, and all the other guys. Mm -hmm. And then you have the mobile operators, if we look at the license mm -hmm. spectrum. So, so, so I, I think there are, are, are winners in all of those parts, but they are winners in different ways. If you look at the semiconductor companies, they've been sort of more the growth drivers and, and so forth. If you look at the handsets and, and all of those things, have also been growing, while the operators have been more the cash cows. So the operators have actually sort of put in and bought all these Spectrum and, and put all that money into Spectrum. Mm -hmm. They are also sort of uh, almost um, incubants in the market because they have very little competition and so forth. 
So they are sort of the cash cow. So if you want to buy a company for dividends, for example, many of the operators are, you know, they give you 5% and you get the very great dividends. So they have a good cash flow out of the company, even if they make all of these investments in the networks and so forth. And, and they have issues with sort of increasing ARPU and growing top line that still are very, very profitable. So there are different players in the market, but, but all of that put, putting together works actually quite nicely as it is right now, even if there are people who are negative to the operators because they don't mm -hmm. get the growth, mm -hmm. but still they get extremely good cash flow. And one of the things that will create more growth now is actually fixed wireless access for them. Because look at Verizon, look at AT&T. They are now stealing customers via fixed wireless access from the cable companies because they can now put the gigabit uh, 5G in there rather than, than sort of fighting with the fiber, which have had gigabit before. So there is a change there, and that's where they are trying to sort of increase their ARPU and, 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 and the revenues. Okay, okay. Uh, it's, it's very interesting. Uh, maybe a bit of shorter term question and, and relate, related to both you and, and others. I mean, there's been talk about this component shortage for, mm. for a while now. Yes. Uh, and, and it's also been hurting you, of course. I mean, it's been yes. hurting everybody. Uh, but you're kind of in the sweet spot, but it's the wrong word, but you see <laughs> what I mean in, yeah, terms yeah, of yeah. In, in terms of this exposure, because it's yes. been on the electronic side and it's been on the chip side. Yes. Is it the chip side which is the, the, the main, has been the main problem for you, or is it broader than that? It is a bit broader, uh, and, and uh, the, the thing is that the reason because that we ended up in the sweet spot is that our customer mix has been sort of, you know, we were about to launch most of the customers, and, and they were about to launch exactly when the pandemic started. And, mm -hmm. and uh, the, 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 the market wanted, you know, more data at that point, but... The, th the things that our customers then had built or, or was ready to roll out was not ready for network approval and all of those things. So, so, P so the operators has been buying the, the old equipment and putting that out more or less. So that makes uh, th that's one part of it. The other part was that now in the in sort of surprisingly enough, I would say, uh, a, a sort of a general component shortages ha happen now in the in the late 2021. When not just you know the chips at TCMC for for you know uh, MPUs and all of that, but also components as clock buffers suddenly sort of disappeared on the market because they were buying that to a lot of different things. So suddenly we had customers that had to focus on redesigning their old products that they were selling a lot of uh, and moving resources over to that, and at the same time needed to redesign our stuff to get other clock buffers so they can actually release it. So. Take eight devices as a good example. They spent six months now to, to change a clock buffer who had 24 pins to 16 pins and then sort of making that happen. And now we got the order and that was six months later. So it has been very, we've been very unlucky in that sense to, to sort of end up there in the, in the uh, pandemic. But I, we'll see now that there is a change coming and, and we're moving on from that. And, and the world is redefining the pandemic to, to influenza and all of that. And I think that's going to change. Yeah, because I know that before we talked a little bit about semi-fabs, for instance. Yes. And, and I mean, we know that TSMC and, and Intel, etc., yes. is putting in enormous money in investments, yes. but it takes time to build a fab, right? Absolutely. So we're working that through. And on the component side, is it is it any... I mean, do you see any light in the tunnel, or, or is it... Yes, I mean, we're seeing now that customers, or specifically for us, we don't have any problems with our components. We have a, a, a full warehouse of it. Mm -hmm. but, but now, you know, when, when the customers are taking those parts and, and changing the parts that are lacking and have been end-of-life to whatever it is, we're seeing now that we can get orders like this. So, so uh, that's why we said, like, from second half this year, we'll, mm -hmm. we're sure that this will ease up. Okay, yes. okay. Yeah, it's, con it's confident, because I know we had this discussion. I think I had, I mean, I've had plenty of discussions about component shortages mm -hmm. in, the, in the past year. And I think in last summer, it was the same kind of hopes. And then mm. everything clogged up again in October, in, in August, September, yeah, October. Yeah, so October, November was suddenly a lot of things changed, unfortunately. Uh -huh, uh -huh. But it's very, su it's very surprising, unfortunately, to us, because it was components that we never thought would be go. Uh, clock buffers are standard components. That's uh -huh. 50 cent components that cost $72 uh, <laughs> at yeah, some point yeah. if you wanted one. So, yeah. And, and longer term, I mean, I mean, there's lots of things going on. It's geopolitical. It, mm. It's where is China and Russia going to stand in the whole mm. thing? And and you had the, the conflict between the White House and the Chinese already before. I mean, mm. it started some time ago. 
have uh, now we have had the pandemic, so you've mm. had all the supply shortages yeah, and, yeah. and problems with the supply chains, etc. I mean, have you started to think about longer term how? Huh? Because I guess the geopolitical issues, mm. especially and the trade wars between yeah. China and the US, is is not going away. No, no. Sorry. So have has it been time to start thinking about these issues longer term, or is it mm. a bit too early? No, no. I, I mean, we, we are constantly looking at the strategy and, and where we want to go. So, I mean, uh, currently, of course, uh, we, we're buying a company in the US. And, mm -hmm. and, of course, we are leaning towards the West here because it's much safer for us. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, in that way, we have uh, sort of a much uh, better position, I would say. And also, you know, getting into that ecosystem with Global Foundries, for example, which now will be an owner, yeah. which is very, very important for us. And we have great meetings uh, two weeks ago when I was in the U.S. with all the management there. So, I mean, we are sort of strategically moving our focus into the West rather than into Asia, even if we can keep on selling in there and so forth. But mm -hmm. we don't want to sort of end up sitting on that value chain if, the, if this keeps on going on. So we've already made that decision and working yeah. in a different direction. And I guess it, it's, I mean, you being a European company, even though it's a global value chain, etc., but I think Volain was talking about the other day about Europe being 20 or 25% self-sufficient in, in, in chip manufacturing. Those mm -hmm. kind of investment streams surely got to benefit you. Absolutely. And, and I mean, in the photonics business, we have our own fab in the UK mm -hmm. even. So, I mean, and that's a really sort of good thing now. And, and uh, we're quite excited to hear about the European Union going out with 48 billion euros now yeah. to, to sort of create this chip industry. So... There is coming f good things out of the pandemic and the understanding of creating own value change and stuff. And, and I think we, we don't know yet, but that could be a really good thing if we can get part of that money into our fab in, in Glasgow on the photonic side, which mm -hmm, is, mm -hmm. I mean, from 5G, the only other hotter area in the world is photonics or silicon photonics right now. Yeah, so that's yeah. really interesting for us. All right. Uh, super interesting. Just a quick question about your, your recent acquisition. Uh, so talk a little bit about that. We, we mentioned it here, but where do you see, I mean, what will we see? Should we expect anything near term? What kind of synergies are you expecting? Are more on the sell side or on the cost side? Well, on both sides, but most, mm. mostly on the sell side, I would say. Uh, I mean, uh, Mixcom have been really efficient on, on winning customers lately, bringing in interesting customers like the Satcom, the Tier 1 customer, the repeater, and, and also being sort of connected into the U.S. ecosystem and market. They have a really good connection. So take uh, pr uh, Professor Harish, who has been sort of the, one of the founders. He, he's been working out of Columbia University and, and all technology guys coming there and talking. And, and Sievers has been delivering evaluation kits there for years. So we have had a full good relationship. So all of those things that brings in the closeness to global foundries, the closeness to the U.S. markets, no customers, it's a lot of things. And then, mm -hmm. of course, we're going to get synergies on, on uh, the cost side as well, bringing all of these things together. But they are not huge, but they're going to be some, some money, like maybe 10 million <laughs> less in cost okay. and so forth. But it's still something. Okay, and then finally, I guess you got an, you got a lot of large orders in photo in in photonics. Yes. So, what kind of what is the timeline for these, and 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 when should we expect to see, a sh I mean, a shift change in in production and then sales? So it's a good question, and, and we have sort of, you know, we got $12 million in orders from one of the Fortune 100s, and we're going to keep on getting uh, sort of that kind of level orders, I think, for some time now. And, and we are working on getting from, you know, the development phase into the volume phase. But it's been very difficult also on that side to know exactly what is what during the pandemic, or how quickly can things go, and they are not always open about everything else that's happening around this sensor for this consumer product. So... I mean, we're hoping as soon as possible, and we want it to happen as soon as possible. But it's a bit, bit hard to say, but we feel very confident. We're still working on the project, and we assume more orders are going to come and so forth during the year. So um, we are in a very good place, and we delivered good things there. Okay. Well, excellent. It, it's a super interesting topic. We could stand here all day talking <laughs> about 5G, but I think our time is out. So thank you very much for coming here to discuss with us. Thank and you. And thank you for Great listening. To be here.